Okay, the other principle, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. And the Bible says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. So every part of scripture is really talking about something that's happened before and something that will happen in the future. Eloi says that the whole Bible was written more for our time than for their time. That means that every part of the Old Testament and New Testament has a relevance for the 144,000 or for the last generation or for the generation living in this time. Uh, if you study the book of Psalms, a lot of the prayers or a lot of the Psalms are to do uh, are prayers for the 144,000. Psalms talks a lot about perfection. Psalms 51. Pray to be a clean heart. And renew a right spirit. Um, there are other songs that talk about God being a uh, uh, you know, like Psalms 46, right? God is a, is our refuge. An ever present help in time. So a lot of these prayers uh, are prayers for the 144,000 or for those aspiring to be the 144,000. These are prayers that we should be praying. And if you look at the epistles, many of the epistles talk about, uh, you know, almost all the epistles talk about two groups of people. Both of them within the church. It talks about the wheat and the tears. And we'll be studying some of the epistles too, and, and I'll show you that as we go through. So as we study every Bible text, as we're studying every book of the Bible, there is a there is a prophetic context for all of us because there is no new thing under the sun. The devil repeats his strategies all the time. Uh, even the Old Testament stories. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, you know, when David, uh, when Absalom is caught in the tree and, uh, and David's general, what was his name? Joab. Joab uh, kills, kills uh, Absalom. 
ตัวอย่างอย่างเช่นอับสลอมซึ่งเป็นลูกของดาวิดที่เป็นกบฏแล้วก็เขาเนี่ยติดอยู่ที่ต้นไม้แล้วก็โจอับซึ่งเป็นแม่ทัพของดาวิดเนี่ยก็เอาหอบฆ่าอับสลอม And when the news is brought to David, David breaks down and cries. And he says, uh, "Oh Absalom, Oh Absalom, uh, if my son, if only I could have died in your place." Do you know who Absalom represents? เรารู้ไหมอับสโลมนั้นหมายถึงใคร Absalom represents uh, Absalom is described as perfect in beauty คำว่าอับสโลมเนี่ยหมายถึงว่าสมบูรณ์สมบูรณ์ด้วยความงดงาม And uh, in uh, Isaiah ในอิสยา28บทที่28 It talks about the king of Tyre ได้พูดถึงกษัตริย์ของไทรัตไทรัตซึ่งสมบูรณ์อซิเคิลสอร์ทวีเอ็ดไม่ใช่อซิเคิลทวีเอ็ดอิซิเคิลบทที่28นะครับไม่ใช่บทอิซิเคิลบทที่28ที่พูดถึงกษัตริย์ไทรัต So Absalom represents Lucifer เพราะฉะนั้นอับสโลมเนี่ยหมายถึงลูซิเฟอร์ And what David's reaction แล้วก็การที่ดาวิดเนี่ยมีปฏิกิริยาต่อนั้น gives us some insight into how God is going to react at the very end of time when He has to destroy us. ทำให้เราเข้าใจถึงใจของพระเจ้าที่มีต่อลูซิเฟอร์ในวาระสุดท้ายที่พระองค์จำเป็นที่จะต้องทำลาย Every story in the Bible has some sort of prophetic. Context. And it is those kind of, uh, it's those kind of. This is what I call the goal. It is those kind of insights, these secret things that the Lord has hidden in His Word. That as you study it over and over again, and it pops out to you. It just, it's amazing, right? And it just makes it so exciting. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, Proverbs chapter nine, verse ten. It says, "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy." Is understand. So notice these three words: wisdom, knowledge, and understand. So, according to Oxford Dictionary, knowledge are the facts and information. Understanding is how you use the facts and figures to create. Uh, it means the comprehension of the intended meaning of the knowledge, right? So when I get all the facts and figures, what is that? Uh, what what is the understanding that I can get from these facts and figures? So knowledge is all the facts and figures. When I look at all the facts and figures, I, I put it all together, then I will get some understanding. And then once I understand 
all these facts and figures, then I know how to use it, and that's what we call this. In the world of study, uh, in, in, in the context of how to study the Bible, knowledge is observation, understanding is interpretation. Knowledge is observation. Understanding is interpretation. And wisdom is application. Excellent. So it requires good observation to see the knowledge of the Bible. And observation only comes by reading it over and over and over and over again. Sometimes studying the Bible is like looking at that painting. You know those paintings where they have like lots and lots of dots? And then you have to look at it and you keep going back and forth until you can see somebody's face in that painting. Right? It pops up. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know those where they have like lots and lots of dots and you look at it, it's just all these dots. And if you go closer and you go further away, you go closer, you go further away, suddenly some face, you start to see a face of a person, for example. Sometimes that's what studying the Bible is like. You gotta read it over and over and over and over. And if you just read it once and make an assumption, most likely you're wrong. It takes a lot of reading. It requires good interpretation to understand the knowledge of the Bible. So once you see all the knowledge, all the facts and the figures in that verse, then you can start to look at what does it mean. Well, and then finally, it requires good application to experience the understanding of the Bible. So now that I understand what it's talking about, how do I use it? This is what we call application. Next slide. Now, if I had to give a ratio or time that you should spend on each of these areas, if you had 10 hours, 7 of those hours should be spent in observation. So that means that, let's say in five days, or you have two weeks of studying the same passage or the same, uh, like two or three verses, right? Or the same chapter that you're reading. You should spend seven out of the ten days reading it over and over again. Seven out of the ten days. If you have ten days, let's say I'm going to study Romans chapter one for the next two weeks. Most of that time, you want to spend reading that verse and trying to figure out 
Where, does it, where are the sections of that verse? What are the interesting words in each verse that you want to study out? And what is that each verse trying to say? Is it the same topic in each verse? Okay. And then two hours in interpretation. And one hour in application. Once you get a clear understanding of what that verse is talking about, yep. once you get a good understanding of what the verse is talking about, it's easy to know what the application is. But as we get older, we have this bad habit. We like to jump to conclusions. We like to assume. We like to assume. We make assumptions. We read something and then we think we know what it's talking. You know, have you seen little children or? You know, my, my daughter, when she was around four or five, even today, uh, to a certain extent, but less so, she, she would, uh, whenever we drive, she will ask, why, 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 why is it like this then? And then I'll answer the question, and she goes, okay, but why is it like this then? And then I'll answer the question and she'll say, why, but why is it, uh, why is it like that then? And she'll just keep asking, why, 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 why? Uh, and she'll just keep questioning every, and she'll find something else in my answer to ask why again. But as we get older, we stop asking why. We assume we know why. And we jump straight to the conclusion. So deep study of the Bible actually is putting in a lot of discipline to yourself to say, I don't know why. And many times it's studying the verse and saying, I'm sh am I sure I know why? Or do I need to ask why again? Or should I say, I don't know? Right? Many times, it will, will, I'll show you this as we study the verses, you need to learn to say, I don't know. Because a lot of times we just go, oh yeah, yeah, it's because of this, or it's because of that. We just make up some interpretation. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so observation means observing something carefully in order to get the information. Interpretation means the action of explaining the meaning of something. Application means the action of putting it into operation. So let me give you an example. If I was to describe a nail to a blind man, 
ให้คนตาบอดเข้าใจถึง How do you describe? เราจะอธิบายอย่างไรให้คนตาบอดรู้ว่านี่คือตาโอ How would you describe a nail to a blind man? เราอธิบายยังไงครับว่านี่คือตาโอให้กับคนตาบอดรู้ว่านี่คือตาโอ What would you say? Put it in his hand. <laughs> okay, if you couldn't put it in his hand, you just try to describe. No, me he got that. That's it. By the deal. What would you say? One end is sharp. One end is sharp. Now, if I told you one end is sharp, would you be able to tell me it's an end? No, I will say that. 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 What else would you have to say? Why it's flat? Metal. It's metal. So if I told you it's pointy and it's metal. Is that enough for you to tell me it's a name? Yes, what else? One end is flat. One end is flat. So if I told you one end is flat, one is it pointy and it's metal. Is that enough for you to tell me it's an end? If I tell you that one end is flat, one end is metal, and the other end is pointy, is that enough for you to tell me it's an end? If I tell you that one end is flat, one end is metal, and the other end is pointy, is that enough for you to tell me it's an end? If I tell you that one end is flat, one end is metal, and the other end is pointy, is that enough for you to tell me it's an end? If I tell you that one end is flat, one end is metal, and the other end is pointy, is that enough for you to tell me it's an end? Is that enough for me to know it's a name? Yes, I think so. So studying the Bible in terms of observation is picking enough points that you can conclusively say this text is talking about a name. Many times we just read the text and we go, oh yeah, it's pointy, therefore it's a name. And we completely miss the point because it's a pencil. Do you get what I'm saying? So you have to read the Bible over and over again, looking for the clues that conclusively tell you it's an end. So let me give you an example of wrong interpretation, wrong observation, which leads to wrong interpretation and then wrong application. Yes, so. Let's go to a very common Bible text, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Everyone knows this? We all repeat it together. One, two, three. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Question. What does it mean, all things? Does it mean that I can claim this Bible text by standing at the top of the cliff? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Help me to fly, O God, and then I jump off. Can I do that? Why? It says all things. What he means is, I have gone through hundred and I've gone through. Ah, so you cannot answer because you know all the answers. <laughs> Please. <laughs> But yes, he's, uh, he's right. But that my point is, if you look at the Bible text by itself, Hello. 
it's like looking at a, uh, it's like telling somebody it's pointy on one side. When I ask you the question, what does all things mean? According to Philippians 4 verse 13, the answer you need to learn to give is I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You need to be disciplined in telling yourself when you observe Philippians 4 verse 13 that you cannot conclusively say what is all things. But if Pastor had not answered, if Pastor had not answered, many adults in this room would start telling me, oh, all things, actually it means this. Or all things, yeah, it means that. Or all things, yeah, it actually means this. God doesn't expect, then they start to explain to me, oh, God doesn't expect us to be able to fly, so obviously all things doesn't mean fly. <laughs> but you have to learn to say, I don't know. <laughs> and when you say, I don't know, what you then have to do is study the verses before and study the verses after. <laughs> Many of us today, when we hear a sermon, and the pastor goes, I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. That means you can jump off a cliff and fly. No, I mean, many of us, when we hear something like that, we go, oh, oh yeah, okay, Pastor, I believe you. But in the early Adventist church, in Eloise's time, if anybody stood up here and said, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me, you can jump off the cliff and fly. You know what would everyone do? Immediately, the whole room would open up their Bibles and start reading the verses before and the reading and the verses after. And when the pastor walked down the steps, there will be a line of people coming up to him <laughs> and say, Pastor, you just preached heresy. <laughs> pastor, you just preached heresy. <laughs> Because if I read verse 12 and verse 11, you got the wrong interpretation. The people had only respect for correct interpretation of the Bible. The Adventist church was set up, or the Adventist church is a church of Bereans. We respect the pastor, the elders, and the leaders of the church only as they as they stand on the word and the word of God. And the pastor is to only be respected when he stands and preaches the word of God. And we are a church that needs to hold one another accountable. Accountable. 
We are not the Roman Catholic Church where the Pope says something and it's infallible. We are all fallible men. Even the elder, even the pastor, even the conference president, even the union president, even the GC president. And, you know, uh, but in Asia especially, in Asian countries especially, you're not allowed to question the pastor. But we must be a church. Otherwise, we will follow the pastor or the elder or the deacon into error and deception if all we do is sit here and believe every word that's preached from the pulpit. We will follow the pastor and the elder and the deacon into error. If we just believe, if we just believe everything, if we just believe everything that's being preached from This is why it's so important for us to prioritize and create the culture of studying the Bible. So, let's go and read verse 11 and verse 12. Verse 11 and verse 12. And we'll see what Pastor already shared with us. Verse 11 and verse 12, it says, Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, there's the word all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things, as a repetition of the word, through Christ which strengtheneth me. ข้าพเจ้าไม่ได้กล่าวถึงเรื่องความผสมเพราะข้าพเจ้าจะมีฐานะอย่างไรก็ตามข้าพเจ้าจะก็เรียนรู้แล้วที่จะพอใจอยู
ือว่าฉันจะผ่านฉันก็พอใจทุกอย่าง That's the right นั่นแหละคือความหมายตีความหมายที่ถูกต้อง So can you see that it's really it's quite important to know what is the what is the uh, observation what are the words what are the texts before and the texts after and then you will be able to get the right interpretation and then after that I'll be able to get the right application เพราะฉะนั้นเห็นไหมครับความสำคัญต่อการสะสมข้อมูลเพียงพอเพื่อที่จะสังเกตสังเกตแล้วก็เข้าใจแล้วก็ตีความหมาย So really, the right application of this verse is whenever you are in difficulty, whenever you are facing trials, I can do all things. I can pass through these trials and learn to be content. ดังนั้นข้อพระพีเนี่ยเมื่อเรานำมาประยุกต์ใช้มันก็จะบอกให้เรารู้ว่าไม่ว่าเราจะอยู่ในสภาพใดก็ตามเราสามารถทนทุกอย่างได้ด้วยพระเยซูคริสต์ผู้ชูนำ Yes. For the sake of the gospel. Sorry. For the sake of the gospel. Right. For the sake of the gospel. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's uh, let's stop here. Hey, let you pack some food. And uh, we'll let's buy it for what prayer. Hey, let's eat some food. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us as we have studied your word. Please refresh our minds. Uh, and uh, help us to be able to digest and to understand the words of life as we continue to study. We continue to pray for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide. For this I pray in Jesus. Amen. Let's take.